Good morning, good morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the joy of worshiping you and to acknowledge that from, from you all blessings flow and without you no blessings flow. Thank you, Lord. May our worship be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. The reason Psalm 81 was chosen this morning is because <clears throat> it was one specifically, if you recall from the psalm that we just read, uh, there, there's a point where he says, uh, we, we say this on our feast day, an ordinance of God. That feast day that was in reference was called the, the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. Well, Will, what does that have to do with our with our sermon passage today? Well, if you would open with me to John chapter 7, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, we are continuing in our in our ser sermon series on the Gospel of John. Uh, thank you again to Chris Horrell for standing in the gap for me last week. Um, the, our family was out of town celebrating somebody's 70th birthday. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And Chris was kind enough to uh, to change around our schedule a little bit to uh, to preach in my place. Um, and so he finished chapter six for us. Lucky him. And uh, we're going to be starting up with chapter seven today. Uh, for those of you who are visiting today, uh, we treat we try to treat this book as best we can as the word of God, because it has been given to us as his word. And so uh, the sermons basically are we choose a book and we walk through it because we want to see the entirety and the wholeness and the context of what God is saying to his people for all time. And so today we come to John chapter seven. <clears throat> and right out the gate, we actually see something uh, that, that tells us a little bit that there's been some time passage between chapter six and chapter seven. After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee. <clears throat> the after these things is probably about six months later. And so there's a six month gap between the end of chapter six and the beginning of chapter seven. Well, how do you know that, Pastor Will? Well, I'll tell you. Um, I didn't, but I learned this over the week. Uh, the, so the chapter six takes place almost entirely around the Jewish Passover. Uh, because it is around that time, it said, uh, right before Jesus turns the, uh, the the five loaves and two fish into many loaves or many fish, um, that is around Passover at this point in time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then uh, we see here, chapter 7, after these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths was near. Or the Feast of Tabernacles, as your script, as your translation might say, it's the same word. It means the same thing. I'll explain that as we go. Uh, the Feast of Booths was six months later than the Feast of, uh, of, of Passover. That's pretty much that's how we know there's a six month gap. And you say to yourself, "What? I'm sure a lot of stuff happened in that six month gap. Where can I read about that?" Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke really covers in detail the the events of those six months up in Galilee. <clears throat> and so, with all of that said. Let's go ahead and read the passage we're looking at this morning, which is John chapter 7, verses 1 through 13. After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths, tabernacle, was near. Therefore his brothers said to him, leave here and go into Judea so that your disciples may see your works which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers were believing in him. So Jesus said to them, my time is not yet here, but your time is always opportune. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it, that its deeds are evil. Go up to the feast yourselves. I do not go up to the feast because my time has not yet fully come. Having said these things, he stayed in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he himself also went up, not publicly, but as if in secret. So the Jews were seeking him at the feast, and they were saying, where is he? There was much grumbling among the crowds concerning him. Some were saying, he's a good man. Others were saying, no, on the contrary, he leads people to strike. Yet no one was speaking openly of him for fear of the Jews. Let's go. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray now that you would soften our hearts, open our open our eyes, open our minds to receive your word and the instruction that you have in this moment. Mold us, Lord, into your image. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so uh, before we jump into the, the passage proper, I just want to give a little bit more context on the Feast of Booths. Um, 
Who here has ever been to the Feast of Booths? Jenny is raising her hand. <laughs> uh, Jenny, uh, Jenny went to the University of Hartford, which is an, it's a very uh, densely Jewish population at the University of Hartford. And one particular year, at least, the, the, the Jewish population were putting on a Feast of Booths. Um, and so she, along with everyone who attended, uh, were able to, um, to, to feast, if you will, on just the most Jewish food you can think of, sushi, uh, because it was the only kosher thing they could find in large quantities in the area. <laughs> but anywho, the Feast of Booths, what is it? Where does it come from? Uh, what's, what's going on here? <clears throat> I just want to talk about this a little bit, and then we will press on into the passage. Uh, so first of all, the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles, is one of three what are called pilgrim feasts or pilgrimage feasts of the Jews at the time of Jesus. These, uh, this along with uh, Passover and Pentecost. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Feast of Booths happened to be the most popular feast of the three. Um, and by pilgrimage feast, it means feast wherein it is heavily encouraged that if you are able, you pick up your family and you go to Jerusalem to worship in Jerusalem. Uh, the feast itself is instituted by God in Exodus chapter 23. So this is uh, shortly after the Ten Commandments. This is part of the uh, part of God making covenant with his people. It is instituted in, in Exodus 23. At that point in time, it doesn't actually bear too much resemblance to what it does, uh, like we're going to be reading here. It was a it was a harvest feast, is how it was, it was originally simply instituted by God. Uh, a, a time to thank God for the harvest and the the, the, the what is it the in harvest period. Later, or slightly later, during the wanderings of the Jews, um, it gained further religious significance. Uh, and so we read in Leviticus, this is going to be Leviticus chapter 23. I think we have the reference here. Thank you. Leviticus chapter 23, verses 39 to 43, regarding the Feast of Booths. On exactly the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the crops of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord for seven days, with a rest on the first day and a rest on the eighth day. Now, on the first day, you shall take for yourselves the foliage of the beautiful trees, palm branches and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. You shall, th you shall thus celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. Uh, it shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall live in booths, that's the name, for seven days. All the native born in Israel shall live in booths so that your generations uh, may know that I had the sons of Israel live in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And so there we see God is assigning significance here in that Israel, God brings Israel out of Egypt through the Exodus, through all, everything that happens there. And then they wander in the wilderness for, a, they're in the middle of the 40 years here. And throughout that time, they're living in booths. Um, I think we actually have a picture, uh, Daniel. Here we go. This is, a, this is not a picture from when the Jews were wandering in, in, in the wilderness. It says, this is, however, a photo of a modern day booth in Jerusalem uh, that is constructed for the Feast of Booths. Um, and it's really simple, as you can see, just a few uh, stone, a few wooden walls uh, and some tarp, effectively. Um, and all it served to do was protect the family who was sleeping within it from the elements. It was a, it was a tabernacle. They were a tabernac tabernacling nomadic people. They would wander throughout the wilderness until they came into the promised land and they would live in such things as these. And so the reason it was so important that uh, this be instituted as an eternal perpetual statute for the Jews was the reason any religious ritual was established, so that you remember what God has done. Um, can you think of it this way? You're six years old. Your, 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 your mom and dad say, all right, it's that time of the year, time to get up, let's head out to Jerusalem. And so you get up, you go with your family, you go with your aunts and uncles, your mother, your father, your brothers, your sisters, your cousins, your grandma and grandpa, and you head over to Jerusalem and you get to help as a little six year old putting up the putting up the booth uh, either in, in the uh, in the city walls or outside the city wall. And then there's lots of festivities, huge feasts, beautiful, beautiful displays of religiosity. And then at the end of the day, you all gather back in your booth, you camp out there for the night and you get to listen to uh, old Grandpa Joseph, for example, tell you about what God did for the Israelite while they were 
it's it's a very demonstrative religious ritual. It doesn't just exist to be to be something that is rote, but it exists to be instructive. It exists to be uh, illustrative to um, to generations to come. And it continued on. It continues on even today, but it continued on certainly into the time of Jesus and feast of booths. Uh, in Deuteronomy 16, we don't have the reference for that. In Deuteronomy 16, it is expanded so that it's not just native-born Israelites who engage in the Feast of Booths, but it is anyone who is sojourning through the land as well. Uh, and then the last thing I want to bring up about the Feast of Booths, and this is going to be especially significant later on in chapter 7, is uh, Zechariah 14. So Zechariah is a prophet. He's prophesying. So he's prophesying after the uh, the diaspora, the, excuse me, the spreading out, the exiling of Israel and Judah uh, at the hands of Assyria and Babylon. And he's prophesying about that day of the Lord where the Messiah will restore Israel. Um, excuse me. Uh, and this, the passage we're reading here, I'm not reading the whole passage because it's quite long, but the passage we're reading here is in reference to the day of the Lord. And he says later on in, in, in the chapter, in that day, everyone will worship uh, worship God, everyone will uh, celebrate the Feast of Booths, and anyone who does not celebrate the Feast of Booths will not receive the rain, which is like the worst of curses to uh, an ancient Israelite. This is what he says here, and this is very, very important for what Jesus is going to be talking about later on in the chapter. In that day, says the prophet Zechariah, there will be no light, the luminaries will dwindle, for it will be a unique day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but it will come about that at evening time there will be light. And in that day, living waters, rivers, will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea, the other half toward the western sea. It will be in summer as well as in winter. And so you have these images of Zechariah. Even at night, there will be light, and living water will flow out of Jerusalem. And now, obviously, these are, to some extent, uh, metaphorical images talking about the light of God being present once again in the darkness of Israel and uh, his his sustenance and his provision flowing out of Jerusalem so that all the world can see and worship him. What this does, however, to the Feast of Booths, this is very, very cool, is there are two additional little rituals that take place during the feast. So along with the eating and the celebrating and the sacrifices and the booths, two other things happen. The first one is a, the, the priests will go down to the Pool of Siloam, draw water out of the Pool of Siloam, and that water and other libations eventually will be distributed among the people in Jerusalem, imitating or prefiguring the living water flowing out of Jerusalem to every corner. The other thing that happens is they will set up candelabras throughout the city, and at nighttime, they'll light them up, such that some ancient writers describe it as it was as though it were day in the midst of the night. Um, in the city of Jerusalem when the Feast of Booths came around. These two are going to be very, very important because later on, Jesus, against this backdrop, is going to say things like, anyone who drinks of me will receive living water. I am the light of the world. And that, oh, oh, I get chills thinking about it. We're going, to get, we're going to get there in a few weeks, though, so just hold off on that. But I wanted to give you some backdrop for what the Feast of Booths is, how Jesus is interacting with it, what it is. I'll, I'll remind you of, of a, a few of these things as we go along through the chapter. Um, but anyway, now that we know what the Feast of Booths is, in its entirety, obviously, there's clearly nothing more to learn about the Feast of Booths than after five minutes of hearing about it. We, we ride uh, into the, uh, the passage itself. So after these things, Jesus was, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. We know this is the case. This has been the case since John chapter 5, verse 44. Jesus breaks the Sabbath, and he claimed, and they, the Jews say, he, he's claiming equality with God. And it says, from that point on, the Jews sought to kill him. So it's been the case for a while that Jesus has been a dead man walking, as far as the Jews are concerned. But he is not going up to Judea right now, because that's where the, 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 the central party who's trying to kill him is. Now, <clears throat> the Feast of the Jews, the Feast of Booths, was near. Therefore, his brothers said to him, leave here and go into Judea, so that your disciples also may see your works which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. So we have good old brotherly advice. I do need to pause here for a moment and talk about the brothers of Jesus. 
Um, and the reason I can pause here is because there is disagreement over the nature of these brothers, depending on the Christian tradition of which you are a part. <clears throat> uh, who are these brothers? So Mark chapter six, as well as places in Matthew, give us actually the names of Jesus' brothers, which is quite cool. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Mark chapter six, we see the Jews are talking about him. There's Jesus is saying, you don't know where I'm from. And they say, well, surely we know who he is. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are his sisters not here with us as well? And so we have, I'm not going to talk about that too much, but the point is we have the names of Jesus' brothers. It's okay, bro. I feel you. Uh, <clears throat> so James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. Uh, apparently Mary and Joseph really like J names. Now, context is king. Jesus' brothers, the Greek word there is Adelphoi, and it means, wait for it, brothers. Um, it can also mean brethren or kinsmen. It means that in several places in the Greek Old Testament, it means that Paul uses it as brethren a few times to refer to his fellow Jews, especially in Romans. Um, and the reason I'm bringing this up and harping on it is because most Protestant denominations, of which we are a part, uh, read this as it appears to, to say, which is Jesus' brothers, that is to say, his siblings, that is to say, Mary and Joseph created other people uh, after, after Jesus was born. And so they are the younger brothers, or in this case, half-brothers, of Jesus. The Catholic, Orthodox, and Lutheran traditions, uh, and I believe the Episcopal Anglican tradition as well, affirm what is called the dogma of uh, the perpetual virginity of Mary, which is Mary and Joseph never consummated their marriage. There are theological reasons that they hold to this. Uh, I don't hold to any of those. And, excuse me, what they say is, though the word is a delphoi, we can translate it and understand it as brethren, which is to say possibly cousins of Jesus, not necessarily siblings of Jesus. Um, I want to be very clear. The simplest, clearest reading of these passages is that Jesus had brothers, and they were, they were, they were uh, brothers who grew in the womb of Mary and passed through, uh, passed out of the womb of Mary. They are his siblings. That is the clearest, neatest, uh, most likely reading of these passages. I, all that to say, I believe the Catholic, the Catholics, the Orthodox, and the, and the Lutherans, the Episcopalians, the Anglicans are wrong on this point. Hold this gently. This, because they disagree with us on this, does not mean they are not Christian for this reason. I want to be very clear about that. It just means I think they're probably wrong. So I want to lay that out there. You can ask me more about that in the Q&A time if you like, uh, but it's worth noting because it will come up if you're talking with Catholic Orthodox brothers and sisters. All that said, interesting note about the brothers. We see here that none of them believe. Another interesting note, and I'm going to, I'm going to do another tangent here, and I apologize. We are going to get through this passage. Um, none of them believe. Now, at this time, none of them believe. According to church tradition, eventually all four of them will come to believe. We know for certain two of them come to believe. Why do we know this for certain? Because two of them are named James and Judas. Different Judas. Judas is also called Jude. Does that ring a bell? <laughs> so James is the leader of the church in Jerusalem after Jesus rises from the dead, ministers for 40 days, and ascends into heaven. He also writes the book of James. Jude writes the book of Jude, which is the second to last book in your Bible. It's very, very short. Uh, but they both identify themselves as James, brother of Jesus, Adelphos of Jesus, uh, Jude, Adelphos of Jesus, um, which nobody else calls themselves that. Paul doesn't call himself spiritual brother of Jesus, something like that. Anyway, so we know James and Jude eventually come to believe. James, we know, was martyred. He was killed for his faith. He was killed for believing Jesus was God, who died, rose again, and ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of God the Father. We know, even if Jude was not explicitly martyred, he definitely risked martyrdom. He risked being killed for the same belief that James held. 
that is, Jesus, the God made flesh, who died, rose again, and ascended to the Father in heaven. And so, brothers and sisters, this stands as extremely uh, persuasive to me, argumentation that, in fact, the resurrection actually happened. Because these men do not believe in Jesus at this point in time, given all of this teaching, all of the miracles they're seeing, and all of these things, the fact that he's their brother. They're seeing Jesus do all these amazing things, and they don't believe, says the text. And then later, they do believe. And so, brothers and sisters, I would ask you this. How many, how many here have a sibling? What would it take for you to believe your brother was God? What, I mean, <laughs> what would it take for you to believe your brother was God? And quite honestly, the idea that he said he was God and then died and then God rose him from the dead, probably pretty good evidence that you, you might take that and say, oh yeah, okay, I guess maybe he was telling the truth. So anyway, I just want to point that out. It's one of the, it's one of the main things we can point to as uh, Jesus truly did rise from the dead. This is real evidence that Jesus rose from the dead, uh, literally, physically, um, and historically, is that his brothers didn't believe, and then suddenly they did for some reason. Anywho, his brother's advice is this. Go to Judea so your disciples may see the works that you do. Now, we obviously know that Jesus has been doing a lot of signs, a lot of works, a lot of wonders, and his disciples have been present for all of them. What we also know is that very recently, Jesus has given a sermon about being the bread of life, uh, and you must eat my bread. You, you must eat my bread. You must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And what does it say at the end of that passage? Chris talked about it last week. Many of his disciples left. Many of them just walked away. And so, quite legitimately, most likely, his brothers are sitting here going, you know, Jesus, your, your goal seems to be to become known among the Jews. Your teaching is not getting the job done. Why don't you go to this very popular feast, do some signs, give the people what they want, and then the disciples will come back to you, right? That seems to be what the brothers are saying. They are saying, go so that your disciples may see essentially more of your works and be convinced that you are, in fact, somebody worth following. <clears throat> their assumption is that Jesus' main goal is to become known. Now, this is not an uncommon thing for rabbis. Rabbis frequently would just travel the countryside seeking to become known for their wise teaching. And Jesus, among other things, is a rabbi. And so in a lot of ways, the brothers are providing what they believe to be very sound business advice. Um, go and do more signs, give the people what they want, and people will come back to you, and you'll become more popular and more well-known. And that's sort of what you're going for, right? The reason they go with this is because their belief is lacking, because they believe, despite what they are trying to do, trying to help their brother as it seems, they are assuming he is only a man. He is only a man, and as only a man, the goal of a rabbi is to become known. They don't assume that he is anything greater than what he appears to be at the face of it. That's why John points out the brother said this because at this time they did not believe. <clears throat> it is worth uh, noting then how Jesus responds. What does he say? Actually, wait a minute. We're going to hold off on that for just one moment. It's worth noting then. Uh, the kind of advice you will receive over the course of your life from people who are not following Jesus, who do not believe as you believe. Um, I, I have a family member who, prior to Jenny and me getting married, um, was very earnest and very loving and very caring, not a believer. But he said, you know, you guys really, if I can give you some advice, live together before you get married so that you understand your, uh, your quirks and you can work out some of those things before you get married. As a Christian, this is not an option. I can't do this. It, it, it opens the door to all sorts of temptation. It is, it is, it is not above reproach. It, it, it reeks of impropriety. Uh, and it would be the reason it is often uh, taught against in, uh, in, in Christian circles is that it is just, it becomes an impossible temptation towards something that we know is not right. That is to say, to consummate a marriage prior to the marriage itself. And so what this family member of mine was trying to do, he was trying to give well-intentioned advice. And I recognize that at the moment. 
but he just didn't know any better, um, which is, it's, it's a shame, it's sad, uh, but it's not something that I have to look at and go, uh, how, how dare you speak to me like this? It's something I can look at and understand. He is giving me advice. It seems well-intentioned, but I can weigh this against what I know to be true. I can weigh this against the will of God. How do you do that? Uh, I generally point to God's a prayer to God, the principles of God, and the people of God. Pray. So if some, you get advice from somebody, especially somebody who's not a Christian, you get advice from somebody about a, about a particular thing in your life, first of all, pray about it. Second of all, go to Scripture. Here in Scripture are all kinds of principles for living. See if it goes up against it. And my particular example is very clear. This goes, this, this drives against uh, the principles of Scripture. And if you're having, even if you're, even if you're not having difficulty with those two things, but especially if you're having difficulty still coming to a firm grasp, go to the people of God. You're getting, you're getting uh, advice from somebody outside the family of God. Weigh it against advice from the family of God. Go to the people of God. Go to your brothers and sisters in Christ, who you can trust to go uh, good advice. At the very least, advice that is faithful to the word. <clears throat> Furthermore, it is worth noting that we do not do anything for our own recognition, as Jesus thinks, uh, as Jesus uh, denies his brother's view. And so they say, go up, do these things publicly so people can see you, for his brothers did not yet believe. Verse 6. So Jesus said to them, my time is not yet here. This is a, this sounds really dramatic in the English. It's actually not that dramatic. Um, He's, Jesus is legitimately just saying, I'm not going up yet. The time has not yet come for me to go up to the feast. He's not saying it will never come. He's not saying I'm not going to the feast. He's saying my time has not come to go to the feast. And so if you if, if you pull any application out of the sermon today, know that if you're like you're in a social situation and you need to wait a little longer to go somewhere, you have this language open to you. No, my time has not yet come. And it sounds very dramatic and everyone claps and cheers. Anyway, so Jesus says, my time has not yet come. <clears throat> I'm not going up yet. I'm not going to the future yet. In large part, he's denying his brother's advice. Um, you're telling me to go up. I'm not going to go up just yet for the reasons that you're, that you're saying. Then he goes on. But your time is always opportune. Weirdly, this is more biting and dramatic than it sounds. In, 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 I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but Jesus is effectively saying, my time has not yet come. That is to say, my time is dictated fully and must be dictated fully by God the Father. If it is not, then the plan of salvation fails. Now, we obviously know that Jesus uh, is perfectly obedient and so was never even an option. But my time must be fully dictated by the Father. He's also saying to them, your time, any time is up. You can go up He's almost saying to his brother, what you do doesn't matter right now. Go and do what you want. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he's saying, basically, you guys go head up. I'm not going up. Not with you. He expands further. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that it deeds are evil. The world cannot hate you. It has nothing to hate in the brothers. They they are part of the world. They follow all of the same beliefs, practices, rituals, cultural uh, elements. There is nothing that distinguishes the brothers from the rest of the people. They are just like the world. And so if you do that, you will not be hated. Uh, I, for the first time in my life, actually, I just finished reading 1984, which is a horrifying novel, by the way. Um, and uh, within it, everyone is at peace as long as you do exactly what everyone else is doing. As soon as you step out of line, there was conflict and there was pain and there was pain and there was suffering, right? And I think we can actually look at some, some analogs today. We look at analogs with Jesus. So Jesus is saying, there is nothing that distinguishes you from the rest of the world. I, on the other hand, am going about telling people that their deeds are evil. And so everyone hates me. Now, 
is there proof that Jesus is going about saying the world's deeds are evil? Yes, of course. In John chapter 2, Jesus turns over the tables in, uh, in the temple. And he says, you have made my father's house a house of business. And he drives people out with whips. He's pointing out that this is an evil thing for them to be doing. In chapter 3, he, he says to Nicodemus that you are blind without the Holy Spirit. You cannot see the kingdom of God. Essentially saying you are blinded by sin and blinded by evil. In chapter 3 as well, he pronounces that the world is in fact under judgment and it needs a savior, pronouncing the world's deeds are evil. In chapter 5, he says to the man whom he heals at the pool of Bethesda, go and sin no more, lest something, something worse happen to you, acknowledging that this man is evil and does evil things. In chapter 5 as well, he proclaims that he is judge over all the earth, de uh, declaring that judgment is required for the earth and that, that his deeds are evil. Uh, in chapter 5 as well, he expands it out of outside Nicodemus and acknowledges that the Jews themselves are blind because they read the scriptures and do not see clearly that they point to the Messiah, and so their deeds are evil, their, their heart is blinded by evil. In chapter 6, he points out the hypocrisy and the selfishness of people who are only coming to Jesus because they tasted the bread and only get a benefit out of him. He's pointing out that that selfish endeavor is itself sinful and evil, and that they actually have no faith. In every single one of these instances, Jesus angers either an individual, a crowd of people, or the Jewish leadership. Everything that he's done, where he points out, your deeds are evil, somebody gets upset. Now, obviously this makes sense. If you're told the thing that you're doing, that you've done for a long time, that you sort of base your whole life on and order your life by, that's a bad way of doing that. Stop doing it. Your first reaction is probably not going to be, oh, thank you. <laughs> your first reaction is going to be, hey, shut up, you know, stop talking. <laughs> and so everything that Jesus has done at this point, as far as his teaching goes, has revealed the wickedness and the evil of the hearts of everyone he's been speaking to. And as a result, everyone gets very, very upset at him. <clears throat> How do we deal with this as Christians, as individual Christians? The first thing is, I, I would say is this. This is not a call for every single individual Christian to take every opportunity to loudly proclaim from the, from the rooftops the evil of the world around. That is not the call here. However, it is the call that the church should be loved for the reasons that Jesus was loved and hated for the reasons that Jesus was hated. The church should be loved for our service, for our charity, for our prayer, for our, 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 our healing, our hospitals, for, uh, for, for the love that we show one another. We should be loved and appreciated and shown affection for these things. We should never, ever, ever be loved for what I would call seed saving, which is going around saying, oh, you're fine, you're really fine, you're perfect the way you are. I've been reading uh, Jeremiah lately, and Jeremiah constantly is prophesying, God is prophesying through Jeremiah the destruction of Israel and Judah. Or of Judah. And nobody's listening to them. But there are all these other prophets who are springing up, prophets springing up throughout the land saying, ah, the Lord will conquer. The Lord will conquer. Everything's going to be fine. Babylon is going to be pushed back. Everything's going to be fine. And Jeremiah constantly is saying, dear king, king of, king of Judah, don't listen to these false prophets. Anyone who comes to you and says everything is fine is lying. They are not true prophets. The church must stand as a beacon of truth. And so the church should be loved for the reason the reason Jesus was loved, but it's also a call that the church be hated for the reasons Jesus was hated. The world must see with sinfulness. The world must see with wickedness. If it doesn't, it never has the opportunity to see or save you. Now, it's all well and good to say the church must do these things, the church must do these things, but what does that have to do with you and individual Christians? I would simply say this, throughout your life, you will find yourselves in situations where you have an opportunity to either stand on truth and risk the wrath or anger of somebody in front of you, or exchange truth for affection. When you stand on truth and accept the hatred of the person for it, you are furthering the call of the truth. When you exchange truth or affection, my brother, my sister, my friend, you can the call You are working against the people of God. 
I'm saying that severely because it needs to be said severely. You can ask me about that. The church is to be loved for the reason Jesus was loved and hated for the reason Jesus was hated. Once Jesus has made this clear to his brothers, he says, you go up to the feast yourself. I do not go up to this feast because my time has not yet fully come. Having said these things, he stayed in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he himself also went up, not publicly, but as if in secret. The reason I mentioned earlier that he's not saying I'm not going up to the feast, is because if, if we do read this as him saying, I'm not going to this feast at all, then Jesus is lying to his brothers, and that's probably not what he's doing here. Uh, it's almost certainly that he is saying, my time has not come yet to go up to the feast. His brothers leave, he just waits some time, and then goes up to the feast himself. Again, in secret, because he's trying to avoid the, the popularity uh, of him arriving. Which, of course, is uh, kind of angering for the Jews, who are sort of hoping he'll be there for their own nefarious purposes. So the Jews, verse 11, were seeking him at the feast, and they were saying, where is he? Uh, there was also much grumbling among the crowds concerning him. I want to just take a moment here. John uses particular language for particular people throughout his gospel. He'll often say the Jews um, or the crowds or the disciples. I want to be clear. Everyone he's talking about is a Jew. Um, the disciples are Jewish. The crowds are Jewish. The Jews obviously are Jewish. When you see the words the Jews, don't think all Jew. Think specifically the Jewish leadership. And usually in the Gospel of John, the Jewish leadership that is opposed to Jesus. They're looking to get him killed. But I want to be clear, it is not all of the Jews. It is just this subsect of Jews. Um, the crowd, as you'll see in this passage, is the common Jews. They're, they're common folk who probably traveled up to Jerusalem. <clears throat> Jesus, of course, is well known at this point in Jerusalem, in, in Judea, because he's been there before. He's done signs there before. I've been there a couple of times in the Gospel of John so far. And so what we have here is the Jews, the people looking to kill him, are saying, where is he? Because you can sort of feel the kind of hoping, like, if we can find him and catch him in some blasphemous teaching, maybe maybe that'll be the reason we can put him to death. So they're looking for him. But they're not finding him. <clears throat> there was also much grumbling among the crowds concerning him. Some were saying, he's a good man. Others were saying, no, on the contrary, he leads people astray. Now, which of these two things is correct? That's, that's a question. Which of those answers is correct? He's a good man. He's, uh, he's, he's pulling people away. Incorrect. They're both wrong. Um, <laughs> and the reason they're both wrong is this. So obviously, yes, Jesus is good. Sorry, that was mean of me. Thank you for answering. Um, and the reason they're both wrong is this. Jesus is not simply a man, right? And so the Jews are saying he's a good man in the same way that his brothers are saying you're a rabbi looking for recognition. They don't believe he is anything greater than a good man. Rather, he is their Lord and Savior come in the flesh. And the reason I want to point out that that is incorrect is because there's this there's been this weird thing lately with uh, actually Muslim apologists um, it's it's not uncommon. Um, let's see if I want to actually use his name. There's a particular popular recent con convert to Islam. Uh, he, he's a, a, a widely known political and cultural commentator who is just deeply in need of Jesus. Um, but he recently converted to Islam. And one of the reasons that he converted to Islam was he says Islam actually loves God more than better than the Christians do. They love Jesus. They honor Jesus more than the Christians do. Which, on the face of it, it, it sounds like an absurd thing to say. And that's because it's an absurd thing to say. Um, and, but the, the the rationale given is you can. This is how he puts it. You can see Christians will see people walking down the street wearing shirts that say something like Jesus Jesus is gay or something like that or Jesus is trans, and the Christians will do nothing about it. Muslims. They're, they're not going to put up with that. And what he means by that is there is a threat of violence uh, within within Islam that essentially squelches opposition of that sort. And so he's saying, and so for that reason, Muslims fight for our prophets, whereas Christians just roll over. But, uh, now, to be fair, there's something to be said perhaps for the backbone of Christians. However, 
there's a very good reason we don't go and inflict violence upon folks who have dissenting beliefs and, and, and utter blasphemy. It's because there is yet hope for them for redemption. And we know that even if they do not repent in this life, vengeance is not ours. It is God's. And so we actually honor God on his throne as judge more by letting him take care of it. Now, with all of that said, the other thing they point out, the other thing the Muslim points out is we honor Jesus, says the Muslim. And the way we honor Jesus, the way the Muslim honors Jesus, is that they hold him as a prophet for the law. Uh, Muslims actually acknowledge that Jesus existed. They did a few things wrong about him, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But they say he is a prophet of the law. He's even the Messiah. He's the one who came to, to, to save the people of Israel. And they say, oh, okay. And they say, we, we will fight for our prophets. You don't fight for your prophets. Say the Muslim to the Christian. And so on the face of it, from a very human perspective, yes, there was greater honor being bestowed upon Jesus by the, the, the Muslim uh, the Muslim crowd than the Christian crowd. But then you look at the Muslim and you say, was Jesus God? Well, no, that's absurd. Did Jesus die on the cross and rise again for our sins? No, that's absurd. Perfectly fine saying he was a prophet, he was a good man, a great man of God. But they cannot say he was God made flesh. They will not say he died and rose again. And I want, to, I want to point out to you the absurdity of this comment. It would be like me saying to Chris, who did a wonderful job preaching in my stead last week, Chris, you preached a, such a wonderful sermon uh, for, you know, for a dog. You know, like it would be me saying, Chris, I didn't, I didn't know dogs could talk, and yet here you are getting a good sermon. I, I'm reducing Chris to like an order of magnitude lower as a life form than he is. A, if, if you're confused about the fact that dogs are lower life forms than humans, then we can talk lower. What people are doing when they say he's a good man. No, on the contrary, he leads people astray. They're arguing about the wrong thing. They're arguing about simply the content and the, how much they agree with his teaching. As though he is someone to be agreed with or disagreed with, and that merits, that, that bears out whether he's done the or not, rather than he is God or he is not. It's to, to say, we honor Jesus as a prophet. Is to, it is the same thing as me saying, I honor Chris as a good teacher, given that he's a canine. It is to lower God to less than God. And is there anything more blasphemous than this? And so that's essentially what's happening here. None of this crowd truly believes in Jesus. And so they're, they're arguing over the human elements of his preaching as opposed to who he is. <clears throat> Excuse me. To simplify that, admiration without worship is scorn towards Jesus, because you do not acknowledge who he is. The other thing we see here, actually, is persecution popularizes Jesus. We see at the end of the passage, uh, he's a good man. Others were saying, no, on the contrary, he leads people astray. Yet no one was speaking openly of him for fear of the Jews, that is, the Jewish leadership. No one was speaking openly about him. Now, it's an interesting thing. There's this, there's this sort of cultural, societal acknowledgement. We don't talk about Jesus. And as a result, everyone's talking about Jesus more. <laughs> right? And that happens a lot. Uh, the, the, the places where Christianity is growing the most rapidly tend to be the place where the government or the state says, you will not talk about Christianity. Um, and we wonder why the American church is atrophied so, so vehemently over the, over the centuries. And so we see this, that people are speaking quietly. They're still afraid of the still afraid of the Jews. God is using their cowardice. God is using the wickedness of the Jews to ensure good coming out of it. God works all things for the good of those who love Him and thought according to His purpose. However, this is not to say that these people talking in hushed tones are actually being faithful. They are not believers. They're just talking in hushed tones. To be faithful in persecution. I would say, at its, at its core, at its base, is to be willing to speak openly amidst persecution about Jesus. Be willing to speak openly about Jesus. That is faithfulness in persecution. And it's, uh, <clears throat> I will say, the crowds don't do it here. Furthermore, the disciples don't do it. Uh, the brothers of Jesus don't do it. Mary doesn't do it until after the resurrection. From the uh, and I want to point to this. Speaking of Peter, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna talk about Peter a lot more at the end of the book of John. Peter famously 
denying Jesus three times because he's afraid of speaking openly about his master, his Lord, his Savior, his Messiah. He's now afraid of the real consequences because he has, he, has not, he has not yet received the Holy Spirit. He is not yet truly faithful to his Lord. Then Jesus writes again. He appears to Peter. He restores Peter by the, by the end of the book of John. And then, in, and then in Acts, Peter does this. He preaches about Jesus. Thousands come to him in groves, and the Jewish leadership says, what the heck is going on? Arrest that man, please. They arrest him and the apostle John, who wrote this book. And in, excuse me, in Acts chapter 4, verses 15 through 20, the Jewish Sanhedrin is trying to figure out what the heck to do with these people. But when they had ordered them to leave, uh, to leave the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, this, this, the Jewish leaders are confirming, what are we to do with these men? For the fact a noteworthy uh, for the fact that a noteworthy miracle was taking place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it will not spread any further among the people, let us warn them not to speak any longer to any person in this moment. They don't talk about Jesus anymore. <clears throat> and when they had summoned them in, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, saying, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you make your own judgment. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and done. Peter is willing to deny his Lord three times. And this same man, filled with the Holy Spirit, seeing the risen Lord, cannot stop talking about him, whatever the consequences may be, and only a short time later. When you are hated for your belief, stand with Jesus. This same Peter also writes in his letter to a persecuted to the persecuted church in Asia Minor. He writes this: "And who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation, and do not be in dread, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts." always being ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is given you, but with gentleness and respect. That's what saying. Hate is going to come towards you. People are going to try to hurt you for being righteous and for, for, for speaking truth into the world. Do not dread it, but count it as a blessing. Whenever somebody asks you about the hope that is given you, point to Jesus. When you are hated for your belief, stand with Jesus. When you are asked about your life, point to Jesus. And furthermore, lastly, I will point out where you say, well, it takes a lot of strength. It takes a lot of a lot of boldness. First of all, yes, it does. How do I come across that strength and boldness? At, at the base, at the core of it, it is through belief. How is that belief strengthened? Paul gives us an answer here in Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. <clears throat> Excuse me. He says, devote yourselves. This is, this is him signing off to Colossians. He says, brothers, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up the door to us for the word, so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been in prison, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Paul is in jail, most likely in Rome at this point in time. He is in prison for his faith. He's in prison for speaking about Jesus. And he's writing to the Colossians saying, pray for me, that in every opportunity I have to talk with the guards, with the people who are here keeping me in prison, that I might speak boldly, that my faith might be built up so I can talk. And so I say, when you are hated for your belief, stand with Jesus. When you are asked about your life, point to Jesus. And in all things, ask for prayer to be, to, so that you may openly point to Jesus. This is not, again, coming back to the earlier point, this is not so terrifying a demand I'm putting on you as like street preaching or something like that. I'm not calling everyone here. As soon as we're done, go out, find a corner and start, start street preaching. Now, if God has put that in your heart, do that because you read Jonah. Um, but it does require boldness to stand firm, and you will be called upon to stand firm in the faith in the course of your life. Uh, it simply will happen. People will argue with you. People will assume things about Christians. People will assume things about Christ. People will assume things about themselves that are sinful and wrong and wicked. Uh, brothers and sisters, we are called to be a light in the darkness. We are called to be the salt of the earth. We are not called to be soothsayers. We are not called to be cowards. We are called to be bold, standing on the truth, and yet in gentleness and respect. And the only way you're going to be able to go about this in your life 
is by believing that Jesus is who he says he is, and he has done what he said he would do. He is not just a good man. He is your God, no flesh, who died on the cross and rose again, so he could welcome you into his kingdom, into his heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, embolden your people. We are, uh, myself included, Father, we are uh, soft. Uh, we have not suffered the persecution that many, many who have come before us have suffered. And yet, Lord, use that which, that which we do suffer to show us, to hold up a mirror to our face and say, now is the moment. Now is the moment to trust in you. Now is the moment to believe in Christ Jesus and speak truth in the Let me be a church who is loved for the reason you are loved and hated for the reason that you are hated. In Jesus' name, amen. As always, we have a time of Q&A, question and answer. Um, excuse me. And I will simply ask that the questions essentially pertain to somewhere in the passage or something I said that might need clarification. What do we got? Uh, so, so the, what the brother's names are. Uh, Mark chapter six, I believe. I think I have, I have written down. Mark chapter six, is that right, Daniel? Yeah, Mark chapter six, uh, I believe Matthew, and I uh, Matthew also has it somewhere. I cannot recall the other. I know it's a month. Uh, yeah. Cool, 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 yeah. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And then they took a bunch of them, but that's the relevant to them. Everyone's always taking a bunch of beauty. Trevor, what's a candelabra? This would be a candelabra. Uh, it is a thing that holds candles. <laughs> Now that said, the candelabras used during the Feast of Booth were massive. They were they would have been huge, um, much larger than, than that. That's actually a menorah, uh, which is technically a candelabra, but it's a type of candelabra. Does that help, Trevor? Perfect. Other questions. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face to you and give you peace. Go in peace, brothers and sisters.